Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, it's good. Okay. Uh, let's start uh, today's class. We will um, uh, continue the previous lecture. I had some parts of the previous lecture unfinished, and then we will move to the next um, lecture. We are continuing uh, discussion of, um, I think, big uh, conceptual issue with uh, forecasting and uh, risk minimization. Um, so I'm going first to, I changed the slides from the last time, what I call lecture two, a bit, uh, I added some, um, a bit more discussions of um, um, so last time we finished uh, we discussed uh, how we should uh, interpret the forecast optimality that uh, forecasts are not um, uh, uh, it's we want forecast to be optimal, which means that we want forecast to be the best given the data that we have. But achieving optimality in terms of uh, minimization of risk uh, is a very hard task, almost impossible. And so there are many reasons why we never achieve optimal optimality of a forecast. Um, then uh, I considered another big point from this lecture was uh, that once uh, we start, uh, like when we are doing a, a forecast, we might have, uh, how should I say, say we are dealing with a two-step approach, plugin approach, and then uh, we know what, what should be the optimal form of the forecast, for example, a mean of the variable, but it's uh, even under the, uh, very in very simple situations like a quadratic loss and independently arriving data, that mm, it's like as simple as it gets. And even in this very simple situation, uh, plugging in the mean of the data in, uh, as an estimate of the, sorry, average over data as an estimate of the mean might not be optimal. We might want to shrink it a bit uh, or not a bit, and that that will be a more optimal forecast, And which means that there is actually uh, no optimal forecast for all in the whole parameter space. And that complicates issues even more. And then uh, uh, somehow we need to choose uh, the best forecast, uh, keeping this in mind. And then uh, perhaps we need to do some uh, mean max uh, approach or maybe averaging across the parameter space. And that naturally leads us to Bayesian methods. But before we go to the Bayesian methods, I wanted to uh, talk quickly about uh, the difference between uh, uh, risk versus conditional expected loss. So if we go at the very beginning of the lecture, 
of this lecture. Um, I started it by saying that, so our objective is to minimize risk. Uh, and then, uh, which risks averages the loss over next period Y that we need to predict and uh, over the data Z. Now, um, in the two-step plugin approach, we focused on uh, um, only on the internal integral. Uh, so we were finding the best forecast that can the most the, the, not the most the, the optimal forecast that solves the problem of minimizing this internal integral uh, conditional on data Z. Uh, I wanted to give a quick uh, note on the difference between this internal integral and the uh, whole risk. Uh, there will be two purposes for this. One is just to show the distinction and another use it as a bridge towards a more complicated example that I'm going to discuss next. So uh, let, let me first talk about the difference between risk and this internal integral, which is conditional expected loss. So uh, one obvious reason why these two things are not the same uh, is that the data Z usually is different. Uh, so it usually is random, uh, which means that uh, when we are averaging this object across data Z, we are going through some distribution of Zs. Um, and uh, here is an example to illustrate how it matters. This is a very straightforward example that you've seen in different uh, contexts, context, or maybe uh, not in this way, but so the, the example is a linear regression of linear forecasting model. Uh, it's very useful, I think, to go through this example. So suppose that the true model is the linear regression where beta is the uh, vector of parameters, xt uh, independent variables, regressors, and the error is some IID uh, not necessarily normal, just some ID drawn from a, a distribution with zero mean and variance sigma squared. And uh, we assume that the, uh, any of the errors are uh, independent of uh, past or future data. So any of the errors is independent of the whole vector of the data. Z, we call it ZT. Uh, and here is it is our information set, of course. Uh, then, uh, which uh, here I denoted by Z, uh, here I denoted by ZT. Um, then the usual, if we know that the model is like this, but we don't know the parameters, we just, uh, and we as we are, minimizing the mean squared error, then uh, we obviously are getting uh, uh, least square estimates for the parameters beta, which is given here. And uh, our forecast given a new data xt, our forecast is this. So, so far so good. Then uh, the forecast error uh, will be the difference between the outcome, the true outcome, yt plus one, and uh, the forecast, which is if we substitute the uh, model for the outcome, uh, give gives us this. Then uh, on the mean squared error, the conditional expected loss is this guy 
I sorry forgot to write ZT here. Uh, so conditional on ZT. Then uh, we can calculate, and it will give us this expression. Uh, if you probably you know how to derive this stuff from your econometrics class. If you don't know how to derive this stuff, uh, I provided derivations here. Uh, uh, it's supposed to be standard. Uh, in your free time, you can take a look at it. Uh, then uh, the point here is that uh, uh, the conditional expected loss ZT, uh, is uh, yeah, let me write that I need to. That I have a typo here. Um, so the conditional expected loss depends on the whole uh, data set. Uh, and in this is in this set, in this sense that we are not averaging out uh, the data up until time t when we are making the forecast. Uh, and then uh, at the same time, and this is not risk, this is conditional expected loss. Uh, at the same time, the risk is when we take an integral over the data. So we are taking expectation over data here. And then uh, we can calculate that it's approximately equal to this. Uh, uh, again, the uh, the derivations uh, at the end of the slides, uh, and so here you see how it uh, collapses to a simple expression that doesn't depend on doesn't depend on uh, the data. Now, uh, supposedly. If uh, the data, um, and and yes, yeah, sorry, and this this holds uh, both uh, for random and non-random data. For non-random data, uh, this expression is supposedly also approximately k. Uh, where the k is the dimension of uh, vector uh, beta, uh, and for non for random data, this is also approximately k. Um, now, from here you also see that um, the again our risk is never. The optimal risk will be sigma squared. The optimal forecast will give us sigma squared risk. And that optimal forecast potentially is based on the whole population. But we never achieve the optimal forecast or the optimal risk because uh, we are dealing with a finite sample. And so we always have this uh, additional term because of the finite sample. Uh, and this is just reiterate this point that we made before that uh, uh, among many sources of non-optimality in product of non-optimality of forecasts in finite samples, the finiteness of a sample itself is one source of non-optimality. Other being that we might be using uh, uh, estimates of parameters that are maybe not uh, consistent with the loss function, 
that are finite, that are based on a finite sample as well, and things like that. Um, and, we, and also, again, another source of uh, non-optimality is because we are, might be limiting ourselves to a particular class of models where this class of models might not be the right one. Okay, hopefully this part is clear. Now, I want to move to yet another source of non-optimality, which has a very um, deep insights into whole um, this whole uh, uh, business of forecasting. And I will continue this example, but now I will complicate it a bit. So uh, this is what I skipped last time. Um, suppose now that uh, there are, that we choose, we know that there are k potential predictor variables in our linear model. But suppose that we, so there are k big potential predict predictor variables, but we choose only subset of them, k. Uh, now, what do we know if, suppose we choose only subset of them? Uh, and we go ahead and estimate our model, do the OLS estimation and all that stuff. Now, do we expect, what do we, what, what issues will we have with this? I want you to tell me. Well, if uh, the true model uh, has more uh, regressors than uh, we should have some sort of bias, probably. Uh, okay, where where do we have the bias? I mean, bias of what? You mean uh, the bias of the estimator or uh, the bias of uh, uh, the standard error? Uh, I think uh, it's more about uh, the standard error, about uh, 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 efficiency. Uh, well, usually, uh, okay, you are, seems to me you're conf uh, confusing here uh, the notion of efficiency with the notion of the bias. Uh, if k regressors is all we have, if this k small regressors is all we have, then uh, the linear least square estimator is the best we can do. In that sense, is the most efficient estimator uh, of that uses most of our data. We might also get uh, an emitted variable bias if uh, there are uh, uh, big k uh, regressors and we only have uh, uh, small k uh, regressors. Exactly. So, excellent. We, we get uh, emitted variable bias. Uh, now, what supposedly this is bad for forecasts, right? Because we are not using the right model, right? Yes, uh, and be because uh, there can be a uh, uh, correlation of uh, the uh, explained variable and uh, the error term. Okay, excellent. And this is wrong. And this is a big departure of forecasting from econometrics. Uh, this logic doesn't work here. We actually, and this is a first, well, not first, but uh, 
so far we discussed several departures where where I was telling you that uh, the at the end of the day the most important thing is how well our forecast is doing and uh, it doesn't matter if we don't estimate some parameters precisely and exactly I hope that that example with the uh, shrinkage estimator here I hope that that example would already uh, prompt you to realize that things are quite different when we're dealing with uh, forecasting. We might be intentionally willing to introduce biases in our estimates in order to get a better forecast. Um, now, in this particular example, with the mean squared error and like randomly arriving data and we want to forecast uh, the next arriving value. Uh, in this particular example, the reason why we were introducing the bias into our mean uh, because uh, we are dealing with a finite sample and somehow we want to correct for the uh, finite sample bias. And that's the deep reason why for if our mean of the arriving variables wise is not so large, we want to shrink it a bit to zero uh, by introducing a shrinkage estimator, gamma, gamma yt instead of, and, and gamma being less than one, then gamma equal to one. And so uh, it turns out that the same logic applies in this situation. And uh, it turns out that introducing biases might be a good thing. We might be getting a better forecast from that. Now, why? Let us go through this. Um, so the uh, let's denote us let us denote by this guy the least square estimator beta that is based on the data set of length t, what we have up until the time t, and uh, based on, say, k first regressors, just without loss of generality. So we drop uh, k big mi minus k small regressors, and we use only the first k ones. Now, the forecast error in this example is it's almost the same as we did before, the same logic that I considered like five minutes ago, where we were taking all K big regressors. Uh, so it's this, but now let us uh, add and subtract this object, which is expected uh, value of this regressors, uh, I mean, estimates of parameters beta, uh, conditional on the regressors that we thrown away. So this, uh, I, I defined it here on, on the previous slide. slide. So this uh, random variable generated by the subset of omitted variables and this is minus minus k here, and uh, the ztk is the the one the random variable generated by a subset of k first predictors. So we just add and subtract this object. Now we can calculate the expected error conditional on. Uh, uh the regressors that are it's they are there but we are not including them into the regression into the regression so then uh just substituting this expression here uh we get three terms so the first term is the easiest one a sigma squared is the it uh, is generated by this error. This is uh, so-called irreducible error. 
we potentially, if our model is correct, then uh, we cannot do anything about this error. Uh, of course, if, if our model is not correct, then having a better model can reduce this error. Uh, then uh, the second term uh, is generated by this guy. And uh, it's so-called a source of variance. And I'm going to explain why this is a called the variance term in a sec in the next slide. And, and the third term is the squared bias term. And uh, you could potentially, uh, you kind of already can maybe guess intuitively why the red one is variance and the green one is bias. Uh, so, um, this again, BTK is the expectation of this guy conditional on ZT minus K. So, this is we kind of subtracting, calculating the uh, square of this kind of if we take this out somehow then we are calculating the square of this uh, which is the variance of this guy and then uh, here the bi squared bias is because we subtract the expected value of beta hat k from the true value. And so it measures the bias. But again, weighted by this object. Now, let us, this is intuition, uh, why these terms are called variance and bias. Um, we can find, so we can find what this is equal to. And this is equal to this object. Uh, and then we can also find what this is equal to, this green term. I mean, part of the green term. It's equal to the remaining coefficients that we didn't estimate minus this object, which is uh, equal to this. This is like the OLS, uh, the bias introduced in the OLS regression because we didn't include this uh, minus k terms. Now observe that if we include all regressors, then this would disappear. This would become zero. And so the bias will be zero. If we don't include any regressors, then uh, the variance will be zero. But this will be potentially large. Uh, uh, shouldn't also uh, the bias term be zero if, uh, uh, as in uh, the classical case, uh, we uh, supposedly solve, solve the, the problem of uh, endogeneity and uh, uh, all uh, uh, excluded uh, regressors are not uh, correlated with uh, those regressors that we uh, did uh, include? Yeah, it's suppo supposedly the, this will be zero as well in expectation. Uh, but uh, the difference with uh, observe that um, uh, in this expectation here, we are conditioning 
we're conditioning on the data uh, that we excluded. That's why we have uh, this uh, a bit unusual structure. What you are saying will be true if we will uh, condition on uh, if we calculate the unconditional expectation. Uh, and then we will indeed get that uh, under the minimum, sorry, across, we'll have bias zero. And uh, for the variance, we will get our, that our OLS estimator is, it give us, gives us the lowest variance across all estimators with uh, zero bias in expectation, unconditional expectation. Uh, all right, clear, not clear? Yes, so as I understand, we uh, integrate uh, uh, through uh, all possible uh, uh, sets of data uh, conditioning. Yeah, that's uh, what you t what you said. This is correct that this bias term will be zero if we integrate uh, across all regressors. Um, and uh, this is exactly the source of the bias if we are meet some regressors. So, so far, everything is like, we're not doing anything unusual, except for in econometrics, you would say, oh, having a bias is a problem. Because in econometrics, we are after inference. We want to get an unbiased estimate of parameters unbiased model, unbiased outcome, uh, perhaps, uh, in some sense. Uh, while here, we want to get the minimum risk, the minimal risk. And now, staring at this uh, expression, you can see that potentially we might want to deliberately throw away some regressors which will increase bias but potentially can reduce the variance uh, And why why the the variance doesn't have to drop? Uh, it doesn't necessarily drop uh, if we throw away some regressors, but we definitely see that if we throw away all regressors, then the variance is trivially zero. But the, the bias huge, so it tells us that. Potentially, and and then another yes. So the variance is zero, and then another extreme situation is what you've said. Uh, when we include all of the regressors, bias is zero, but variance is minimum. Uh, so there could potentially exist some points where variance will be a bit lower. And uh, that then uh, in the best uh, unbiased estimate, uh, and bias will be higher from than zero, but the sum of them will give us a lower value than under the best unbiased estimate. And so this is a fundamental point of uh, forecasting methods that we are not after best estimates of parameters. We are not un after unbiased estimates of parameters. What we care about is um, 
minimum risk. The, uh, and that minimum risk can be achieved by introducing some biases, but uh, at the same time lowering variance. Uh, uh -huh. Somehow by uh, excluding some data, we can uh, get a better uh, forecast. Yes. Uh, counterintuitive. Uh, it's counterintuitive. I will uh, prepare a demonstration for the tutorials. I mean, you can you can do do your own demonstration for this. Uh, you can just simulate, take linear regression, say take fifty regressors. Uh, uh, yeah, fifty. Take uh, OLS estimate generated uh, many times, like data set of size like I don't know one hundred, and then see what you get in terms of the expected risk. Uh, in this, you 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 can do it all through simulations. Uh, what you get for the simulated risk when you include all of the regressors and when you drop some of the regressors. And you can see yourself that uh, you can get a, sometimes a better result if you exclude some regressors. And uh, the reason for this again, I mean, the, uh, there is a mathematical reason, of course, which I explained to you that the variance can just drop uh, and uh, the bias can increase. Another reason for this is that you're dealing with a finite sample and in a finite sample, uh, you introduce errors, finite sample biases um, anyway. And uh, you, know, you have errors in your estimates because of the finiteness of the sample. And then uh, by uh, shrinking your estimate, so excluding some of the regressors, uh, you can deal with that error. Um, now, that actually is what I want to say is that this is uh, uh the first place where the naturally shrinkage estimators come in maybe you've heard in somewhere loss and reach estimate loss and reach estimators and loss and reach estimators are just uh, examples of this, so I gave you an example of a uh, shrinkage estimator for this simple made up uh, randomly arriving data drawn from a normal distribution. And then uh, when you go, when you do a similar, apply similar idea to OLS regression, if you want to get a better forecast in terms of mean squared error, uh, you use methods like lasso or reach, and we are going to cover them. And their idea is exactly the same as what I discussed here. They don't, uh, for example, lasso would eventually, depending on the tuning parameter of the lasso, it would uh, throw away some of the regressors and would leave other only a subset of regressors. Uh, while economically, that those regressors that Lasso would throw away, they could matter, but Lasso would potentially throw them away because uh, they uh, in, increase variance too much and don't compensate in, with the reduced bias. Uh, has anybody seen Lasso or Reach? Well, uh, I, I heard uh, about it uh, somewhere, but I, I don't remember what it is. Yeah, uh, same. I, I, I have a question. Um, can't we, uh, what, what about, uh, for example, uh, weighted uh, least squares where we 
uh, weight our uh, observations uh, based on uh, uh, the variance. Uh, and uh, I, I, it seems to me that uh, this is a better uh, approach than uh, to throw away uh, quote unquote wet uh, regressors all together. But uh, you keep uh, this is a good question, but now let's think about it. Uh, Suppose we are in a situation where the model is such that error has a constant variance, and we know this variance is sigma squared. We just know it, that somehow we are in this world where we know the variance of the error. We cannot do anything about it. It arrives, but we know this. Uh, you can go ahead and do your weighted least squares and weight by this sigma square, but it wouldn't matter for these two terms. Uh, does this make sense? Uh, a little bit. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, if you will be do basic, I should say that this idea of bias variance trade-off, so it's usually in uh, machine learning classes, it's uh, one of the big ideas introduced in machine learning. It's like, uh, if you finish this class and you forget everything, this is one thing that you shouldn't forget. This is one thing that you should take away from this class, this huge departure between econometrics and forecasting or machine learning, uh, where you don't care about like unbiased estimates of your parameters, but you somehow are trying to balance variance versus bias. In, oh, oh, oh. Uh, is it a story about uh, overheating uh, models Aha, exactly. And this is uh, the story about overfitting. And uh, it's also, it's of course a story about overfitting. Although, although uh, here uh, we are, let me see. Uh, yeah. I, it's, sorry, yeah, I just was thinking what I wanted to say here. No, uh, it is a story about overfitting. And, uh, but only, um, uh, how should I say? It, yeah, yeah, that's why I, st I stumbled here. It is and it is not. Uh, okay, let's talk about perfect. You heard about overfitting. This is a perfect time to talk about overfitting. And this is another important co uh, concept in machine learning. What is overfitting? How you how do you understand it? If you heard about it, and well, it's when we uh, rely on our uh, sample too much uh, to predict uh, uh, the observations uh, outside the sample. Uh, uh, very good. Now, what? Uh, what does it mathematically mean? Relying on our sample too much. Well, we, for example, uh, might come up with some uh, crazy polynomial that uh, goes uh, through uh, our uh, every uh, single data, data point. Uh, in session, we have uh, zero uh, sample errors. But uh, uh, it, it's obviously not correct uh, somehow. No, it's, it's obvious to us as a researchers that uh, the true model is not some crazy polynomial that uh, uh, goes uh, up and down. Excellent. Now, but you're giving, can you go a little bit like, 
even more abstract than that. So you provided an example of a polynomial. This is a typical example that's provided in this context. But then there is a more precise statement what it means to be overfitting the uh, data. I think the model starts to capture some uh, random events in sample that don't necessarily happen out of sample. And it thinks that they happen. So it may not be correct in general. Uh, yeah, perfect. This is, uh, this is one, one uh, way of intuitively saying what, what overfitting is when the model uh, captures too much the random components of the um, data and in sample and out sample this randomness will be different and then if the model um, adjusted too much to the randomness of the, the, the observed sample then uh, that adjustment too much to that observed randomness in the in sample will not help in predicting out, out of sample because then there will be like new randomness perfect and isn't, but there is yes isn't it it uh about low variance but high bias yes exactly that's what i was actually looking for so this uh, all of this is true i mean when we talk about overfitting what you've all said this is all true uh and there are different like usually we, we when we talk about overfitting we talk about all of this that you mentioned so uh the model adjusts too much to the randomness of the uh, observed sample and uh, the example with polynomial is a classic example here, classical example. And then uh, uh, the, the uh, variance is too much. What it means, it means that uh, the model parameter, the model changes too much from sample to sample. Uh, so now going back so that, that uh, if the model changes so say we draw a new sample uh, of course we all we, in the real world we are dealing uh, always with just one sample but uh, uh, it's rather a hypothetical concept but then we can approximate this concept by doing cross validation and we'll get to that but anyway uh, imagining a situation where we are training model on uh, different samples of the same size, but just coming from the same distribution, uh, independently training, if the model changes too much, then we say that there is too much variance. And uh, there will be always some variance uh, across the different samples when we estimate the model. But uh, hopefully, that too much variance doesn't uh, produce uh, too much then bias. Uh, and if uh, the model changes too much from sample to sample, then we say that there is an overfitting. Now, going back to here, uh, you see, we might be the tricky, not the tricky, the uh amazing thing about this example is that when you gave me an example with a polynomial, which is a great example, you were thinking that we are doing something wrong by fitting that polynomial uh, to the data uh, too much so that it got it comes through every point of the data. Uh, and you were thinking, this must be something wrong. Now, uh, let me dwell on this example, actually. Now, imagine that the true model is a polynom of power 10, and you have only 10 observations. Oh, how many? 10 uh, polynom of, uh, you need uh, polynom of number 10. Yeah, you have uh, 11 data points. So. You just perfectly capture the data. 
this 11 data points with a polynomial of power 10. And imagine that uh, this polynomial of number 10 is the right model, but all you have are 11 points to estimate this model. Will you go with the right model? The answer is no. You would probably go with a polynomial of size one or two. Why? Because uh, if you will be re-estimating that polynomial of power 10 on different draws of uh, size 11, you would be getting very different polynomials, uh, estimates of the coefficients of the polynomial. Why? Because what Daria said, you will be, every time you will be adjusting too much to the randomness of the data. Uh, and that will be the source of the uh, huge variance. And when the new data arrives, you will be making a bad prediction. Um, so even if you know the right model, going with the right model may, may not be the right thing because you potentially don't have enough data. And this is exactly why uh, here, uh, you even if you know the right uh, set of regressors, you're absolutely sure that this is an important regressor and this is an important regressor and like 50 other regressors are important. Because of the finiteness of your sample, you might be willing to throw away some regressors. Uh, and now I will tell you more. Do I have? Yeah, I have it. If we calculate an unconditional variance uh, of the, yeah, unconditional variance, so I take this red term, and now I calculate it unconditionally from ZT. Approximately, uh, the derivations are also in the, at the end of the slides. Uh, approximately, you get this. And uh, you see T appears here, and sigma squared appears here, and K appears here, so it's perfect. If you have uh, T very large, so you have a lot of data points, then the variance will probably be small already. And so then excluding, including a bit of regressors wouldn't help much. Variance wouldn't change much. While if T is uh, small relative to K or relative to sigma squared, then uh, dropping some of the regressors would potentially reduce the, the variance a lot. Uh, and th this is what is written on this slide. Does it make sense? Yeah. OK, great. So we covered one of the fundamental aspects of uh, machine learning. And this is, uh, again, a big departure of machine learning from econometrics, this bias variance trade-off. And uh, everything what you then do kind of goes back to this idea. Uh, now, we constructed this bias variance, we, sorry, discussed this bias variance trade-off in the context of a quadratic loss. But the same idea applies to any loss function. Uh, it's just, it's most cleanly seen on the quadratic loss when you mathematically can like disentangle, uh, divide things. Uh, like imagine doing it with Linux loss. Things mathematically become more complicated, but the same idea applies that under any loss, you always have this trade-off between having more uh, variance or less variance, more bias or less bias. If you add, if you do a more complicated model, or less complicated model. Okay.
So that's this thing. And I just, there is more words in slides, but basically that summarizes what I've discussed and we had excellent discussion. I hope this makes sense to you. Uh, and uh, this will be, I will have a demonstration. Uh, by the way, I don't know who will be teaching uh, this Saturday. It looked like there was one person who wants to teach, I mean, who agreed to teach, but he didn't come back to me. I don't know what's happening, but I hope that uh, we, I mean, we'll go through the, some simulation examples during tutorials on this, because this is an important point. And then, uh, so let me jump to Bayesian approach. I guess this is all we will be able to do today. And then relationship between the two approaches, uh, Bayesian versus um, classical. So just a quick uh, conceptual thing. I am not going to talk too much about it. Just one slide. Uh, there is a some conceptual divide between how Bayesian uh, statisticians interpret uncertainty or probability and how frequentist statistician uh, interpret uh, frequency or pro oh, sorry uh, uncertainty or probability uh, the best it's best illustrated in the basic example was a coin flip uh, so of course how so from the what what it means to say that the probability that a fair coin will land heads is 50 percent from the point of view of frequentist it means that if we repeat the same experiment many times and then we calculate the number of the proportion of hands it will be close to 50 percent so probabilities represent uncertainty is uncertainty about uh, our our lack of uh, yeah so pro, sorry there is no uncertainty is about the uh, realization and probabilities represent long run frequencies of events that can happen multiple times. Bayesian would say. Uh, uh, the probability is uh, about the fact that uh, the fair coin is uh, equally likely to land heads or tails in the, on the next toss. So the probability is used to quantify our uncertainty or ignorance about something. Uh, and so probabilities infer is about information not about repeated trials uh this is just probably you you heard it in different contexts and statistics maybe econometrics uh the big point is that um basic rules of probability theory are the same for bayesian frequentist interpretations and uh, maybe conceptually one advantage of Bayesian interpretation that it can be used to model our uncertainty about one of events uh, that do not have long-term frequencies for example suppose we are thinking about the uh, probability of uh, meltdown of like uh, what uh, the Antarctica that in 100 years because of the global warming it's going to totally melt uh obviously it's not an event that we will be observing repeatedly and then calculate the frequency how many times uh, this event uh, occurred and not occurred in 100 years this is inherently a non-repeatable event uh under the same conditions and so but we can talk about the probability in terms of uncertainty. So Bayesian approach can be more appropriate to talk about events like this. Uh, from the conceptual point of view. Now, 
from the I should say before I explain this uh, Bayesian approach, I should say that uh, in terms of dealing with forecasts, the Bayesian approach allows to uh, I think come up with insights that you don't get from the frequentist approach, although potentially you can get all these insights from the frequentist approach. But this is exactly why you do the Bayesian approach, because it allows you to get all these insights. And let's talk about it. So uh, the approach, probably all of you know, um, many of you know, it starts with the idea that we average risk over all possible models. So before we had risk like this. Now we come up with the prior for the parameters. So we think that we parameterize our model with some unknown parameters, but we have a prior about these parameters. And so then we calculate average risk across uh, the average by our prior. Uh, and uh, now this Bayesian risk is this guy. It is. Uh, it depends on the forecast and on the prior. While the, this risk from the classical approach, it depended on the parameter parameters and the forecast. Uh, and here you immediately can see if in the classical approach we just do weighted average risk, and then we take this as the weight, then uh, we kind of have Bayesian approach as well. So in that sense, uh, everything we can do in the Bayesian approach, we can do in the classical approach. But once we start doing classical approach in the Bayesian way, it becomes Bayesian approach. So uh, the Perhaps if I want to characterize the uh, inherent, inherent, uh, intrinsic, intrinsic difference between Bayesian and classical approaches in this context of forecasting and risk minimization is that you are in the classical approach as long as you are dealing with this object, which many people do. And if you're dealing with this object, then you're in the Bayesian approach. Uh, now, yeah, and uh, we just say that uh, bias decision rule is the, the forecast of Z that minimizes bias, bias risk. And uh, here it depends on the prior P but doesn't depend on parameters theta uh, because we average our parameters theta from the prior. Now, uh, so we need a prior to construct Bayesian approach decision rule. Where where do we get the prior? Potentially, we get it from knowledge of the subject area we're dealing with or we get some convenient prior that leads to convenient results and that, that is maybe very robust to all kinds of situations. Um, so this is uh, perhaps the weakest point of the Bayesian, uh, Bayesian approach is the most criticized. Where do we get the priors? Uh, but the counter argument to that is that in the frequentist approach, you kind of also keep in mind something about the priors. Uh, you just don't formalize this idea. So, and then as in the classical approach, we need some model for the data generating process, which includes these two densities. Then uh, if this is our prior, this is our data, then we can calculate the posterior for the parameters. And then we can use this posterior uh, so that here the posterior is we just apply the 
by us rule. Uh, it's this product divided by the integral over uh, this over all thetas, uh, which is marginal likelihood, and so that gives us the posterior. Uh, now we can then write the definition of the risk in the in the classical sense and posterior density and then we can use these definitions to write the bias risk by taking these three integrals over prior of thetas over data and over the ne uh, next period outcomes uh, then uh, we can write it rewrite it like so we use the definition of the posterior here and then uh, then we can focus on this integral in order to get the best for forecast the, the optimal forecast would minimize this integral and so this is what we focus on uh, so let us uh, consider a mean squared error loss uh, in the classical approach, when we were calculating the conditional expected loss, conditional on parameters theta and data z, uh, we got this. We did it last time. And then uh, if we take the, the integral of this over our posterior, we get this. So that would be, and then over Z, that would be the bias risk. And so uh, then this integral, nothing can be done about it because it doesn't depend on the forecast. And uh, then the optimal forecast should be minimizing this integral. Uh, so we focus on this integral, we calculate the first order condition, which gives us this. And so now the difference between uh, this Bayesian forecast rule, Bayesian decision rule, and the classical decision rule is that in the classical decision rule, our forecast was this, while here in the Bayesian decision rule, it's an integral over our posterior distribution. Um, so to give an example, suppose that uh, we have uh, this is our model for the data uh, suppose that theta parameter theta it's like a linear regression so linear model for the mean and data are normal and suppose that theta is unknown and uh, variance is known then uh, also suppose that the posterior distribution for parameter theta is normal with some uh, mean theta tilde invariance v then the optimal forecast will be this mean uh, and then the question is and in the of course in the, the classical approach the optimal forecast will be uh theta x t on the quadratic loss uh, x t but the question is where do you get this in the classical approach you were using the data to estimate this parameter in the bayesian approach somehow you need to have some value for this parameter and then uh, the question is how we come up with the value of this parameter. Uh, 
Um, we will uh, consider examples of that later. And now let me consider another example, how it looks on the Linux laws. So on the Linux laws, we assume that suppose that uh, the data is arriving randomly from a normal distribution with mean mu and variance sigma squared. Suppose that we know sigma squared, but we don't know mu. Uh, so our parameter theta is, well, it's mu sigma squared, but suppose we know sigma squared. And then we assume, suppose that the prior for this parameter mu is a normal with uh, mu zero, which we don't know. But suppose we know this, uh, tau squared. So the posterior distribution for mu given the data will be normal with mean and variance calculated, uh, presented here. Uh, so this, we just, you can go and do it. This is can be a simple, well, maybe not so simple, but a doable exercise to use this Bay Bayesian rule to calculate the posteriors. Here should be straightforward. You just calculate the integrals. And just to make sure that uh, this is correct, suppose that, say, the sample size is huge. So t goes to infinity. Uh, Suppose if t goes to infinity, then uh, this would go to one. Well, this would go to zero. And so, in, and this would go to zero. So if uh, the sample is infinite, then our prior, the, distrib the parameters of our priors prior do not matter. Uh, but the fact that we assume normal distribution matters, our Oh, well, well, sorry, even the fact that we assume normal distribution doesn't matter. Our, uh, the, the posterior will be mu tilde, uh, which makes sense. So in a huge sample, our prior matters less. And uh, another, perhaps, uh, um, ex uh, another uh, extreme example is where t tau squared goes to infinity, so our prior is like diffused, no information. It's called diffused prior. Then uh, uh, this would go to one this would go to zero. And this would go, oh no, sorry, this not, sorry, it's not, is it to one? Ah, yeah, yeah, it's, it goes to one. And this guy goes to sigma squared divided by T. Um, so again, the mean is, yt tinda which tells us that if we don't have any precise information in our prior then the best we can do is the average so also makes sense it's just to play around a bit with the priors and see how they uh make sense okay now let me take five minutes of your time and finish this I won't really want to finish this. Uh, so if we consider the Linux laws, then uh, which is this Linux logs function, then we can calculate this uh, conditional expected risk in the Bayesian sense with the posterior, applying the posterior distribution. Uh, and that would give us this optimal forecast, which looks very similar to what we had in a classical approach, except for 
again, we have the integral over the posterior. Uh, and then uh, if we assume normal distribution, I mean, we keep assuming the normal distribution, then this guy is uh, equal to this. And uh, we can calculate this integral, the integral from here. So we can calculate the integral and it will give us this object. And now uh, the big difference between uh, um, classical approach and Bayesian approach can be seen from observing this expression. Suppose that we start with a diffused prior, so tau squared is huge. We don't know where our parameter lies. Then the decision bias decision rule will be this. So this goes to uh, t minus one. This goes to zero. This goes to one. So that would be our Bayesian decision rule for tau squared large. And if we go to the classical approach here, which we did slide 13 much earlier, it's this. And so let me just, there is no term t minus one here. So let, let us go back. So this is the additional term that appears in the Bayesian approach. And uh, why it appears here, even though we start with a flat prior, so or diffused prior, uh, we still get something different in Bayesian approach versus the classical approach. And the reason for this is that uh, we are still averaging across uh, the parameter space. And uh, we are taking into account the finiteness of the sample, that it's of size t. If the sample size is large, then uh, so when this goes to infinity, then we get the same solution as the is in as the same decision rule as on the classical approach. But this Bayesian approach takes into account the finiteness of the sample. Um, and so now the last thing that I want to say about the Bayesian approach, uh, the Bayesian approach finds the best average method for any prior. Uh, the classical approach, unless we are doing a sample analog approach with the same, uh, sorry, not sample analog approach, and unless we are solving uh, the risk minim weighted risk minimization under the same rule, unless we are doing this under the same uh, weighting scheme as under Bayesian prior. If we are not doing this, then uh, the classical approach will not give the same result, obviously. Uh, and uh, just by the construction, Bayesian method uh, will generate equal or smaller risk for any values of theta uh, than the classical approach. And so in that sense, the Bayesian approach always dominates the classical approach when we um, deal with the whole parameter space. And at the same time, if Bayesian approach and classical approach give the same results, then the classical approach cannot be beaten because Bayesian approach is the best uh, somehow. But maybe not so important. The important thing is that, uh, uh, again, perhaps one takeaway from this is that Bayesian approach just uh, tries to find the best decision rule that works on average on the whole parameter space, w works well on the whole parameter space. And this example, this last example is supposed to el illustrate uh, that the Bayesian approach is always 
always dominates a classical approach if we are comparing uh like Bayesian approach under some prior and the classical approach say two-step plug-in estimator so we go we continue considering Green X laws the same example as a few slides back so we have uh, Gaussian data uh, then uh, under classical plug-in estimator the risk is this we created it before well we didn't calculate I showed you the formula but you can calculate it while uh, you can calculate the Bayesian risk that it's this it takes some time to derive this but uh, you can calculate it by just averaging over the normal uh, posterior then the difference between this the classical and the Bayesian is this which is positive uh, and the point is the lesson from this exercise is that uh, the Bayesian approach is always better than the classical approach because we consider it uh on the whole how well it works on the whole parameter space um okay so i think yeah i finish here i think i said all the important points this is the last two slides are important but you can look through them and ask questions if you have any questions uh we will have some practical exercise for comparing Bayesian versus classical approach and then uh, I'm not sure what's going to happen this Saturday who will be teaching uh, maybe I will teach maybe someone else will teach this Saturday okay yes I have a question about the Bayesian and classical approaches so mainly Bayesian approach uh, it works better than the classical because it's basically just like, you know, the more general case, as I got it. But uh, you've mentioned that in some particular situations, classical approach is better. When is it? Uh, what I meant is that... Uh, uh, well, one thing is that uh, obviously if uh, your prior is bad, then the classical approach will be better uh, if you chose the wrong prior. Um, what I, but I, I, maybe you're referring to this bullet point? Are you referring to this bullet point? Yes. So what I meant here is a bit different. What I meant here is that uh, if uh, it happens that the classical approach and Bayesian approach give the same uh, forecasting rule, the same decision rule, then uh, the classical approach cannot be beaten because uh, it's, uh, how should I say it? Because uh, some, yeah, how should I say it? Because the Bayesian approach uh, usually dominates classical approach under uh, properly chosen priors. And if uh, they happen to coincide, then the classical approach is the best we can do. Can we like? Yeah. Hmm. Can we like uh, roughly say that Bayesian approach uh, manages, uh, well, manages to better choose the um, the decision rule, but uh, if uh, it happens that uh, it uh, has chosen the same decision rule it's like 
less precise or something? Uh, it's not about being less precise. It's about uh, the more about than uh, if both approaches are the same, give the same decision rule, then uh, uh, it's the best we can do. Something like this. Mm. Okay. But mm. it's more like an exception, I guess. I guess, yeah, because uh, usually they don't give to the same, the same, uh, the, the, the same uh, decision rules. And uh, the second question uh, is more like an organizational one. So you mentioned on last, well, you mentioned last uh, Saturday that you were going to give us some assignment if you have sent it yeah. to us, we did not re receive it. Yeah, sorry, I didn't send it yet. Uh, I will do it. The thing is that I was trying to figure out who will be teaching and then how to adjust. Uh, but I will uh, do it. Uh, I will try to do it today. Uh, later. I will send you the first assignment. And actually, I want I wanted to give you an assignment for uh, Bayesian versus classical approach. And I wanted to, and then uh, the assignment uh, uh, to work with data the same way that we did it in the during tutorials. So today will be a perfect time to give you an assignment because another reason why I waited because then I thought that I want to finish this lecture and then give you an assignment that uh, illustrates the difference between Bayesian and classical estimates uh, for practical matters. But we haven't really started any Bayesian estimates yet. Uh, I will provide you some notes and it should be uh, clear and it would be a great point to give it now because then if you have any questions, you can ask them during the next tutorial. Okay, thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you for coming.